Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of I Like to Read with me, your host, Rachel Polanski. What's up? It is almost July at the time of recording this. It's definitely going to be July when it comes out. Um, you know, we don't need to get into too much of like, oh my god, the world is opening up and back to normal and existential crises and like, oh my god, I actually have to like go into public and like see people, but it's fun. It's like in small doses, I think, you know, like having at the most one plan each weekend night is like the most or weekend, whether it's a day or a night thing, that's the most I can handle right now. But this, the, the slowly, you know, tiptoeing back into the world has been pretty nice and, you know, forgot how actual, you know, like leaving the house and social interactions can be fun. Although I just always want to come back to my books, but don't worry, there's still plenty to talk about. Um, I'm going to link below because I think the episode before this is my conversation with Christina Sweeney Baird, the author of The End of Men. I believe I uh, mispronounced her last name in the last episode and called her Christina Sweeney McBaird. Um, so disregard that, but that'll be linked below. We talk about her debut novel, The End of Men, which also deals with a pandemic world, except this pandemic is what happens if 90% of the men die and women have to take over society and live on. And so it's very well written. Um, we talk about her book, but also just all things dystopian and what it's like to publish a book during a pandemic. Um, she's also a young author. She's only a year older than I am, which I always find incredibly impressive. So check that out if you have not already and then the episode after this one um is going to be so so exciting because i am ha not that they aren't all exciting because they are but i'm having author Lori faria stolars who i discussed her book jane anonymous just a few weeks ago and if you're familiar with her work at all she's written at least 17 novels i've been reading her since the blue is for nightmare series came out i remember reading it when i was like 12 years old and following her work ever since then and i'm now 27 so she's been um publishing for over half of my life and her work has been in over half my life um so i'm very excited to see what we will talk about and future me is going to enjoy that and present me at the time which is future me when you're listening to it but also your present day you um i say um a lot especially like when i don't have things scripted i've noticed that you know i pick up on other podcasts sort of how they approach the the freestyling improvisation because of course while I planned the books in advance none of this is actually scripted I mean sometimes I come into it with like more concrete ideas sometimes I just sort of fly off the cuff sometimes I'm on Vivance sometimes I have caffeine sometimes I'm just me in my true form so you never really know what you're gonna get um See, um, because it's sort of like a filler. I sort of think I speak before I think sometimes, and sometimes that results in an um or a sentence that doesn't make sense. Uh, <laughs> um, so definitely something I need to work on. I do apologize for the ums and the likes, but I also don't want to be scripting this podcast. It's what comes out in the moment and what you get is what you get. Hopefully within time, I mean, I, I definitely feel more cognizant and aware of it and trying to focus on it, at least from the beginning. God, the ums and the likes and also just the sound and the setup. We've come a long way. We are, this is episode 49, so we're almost on episode 50, which is crazy. I don't know the exact date that we premiered I Like to Read. I believe it was in July, so it's crazy that we're coming up on a year of I Like to Read. Maybe I'll do some sort of um, extra special extravaganza. I mean, you would think that episode 52 would be one year year but I did skip a couple of weeks so maybe we've already hit a year who knows um um like take a shot every time I say um or take a vape hit and you will be dead just kidding we don't want to promote any death on this podcast beyond what happens in the books but shall we get to it uh <laughs> um literally like if I ugh, it's so frustrating I wish I was a robot where you could just like deprogram the word um and I do feel like like is equally annoying but stands out a little bit less than um because like does fit into our natural vernacular it used to be like oh he was like that or like that whereas um is really just sort of a like okay i'm actively thinking and you're hearing me actively think and here is me actively thinking and not knowing what to think and here is me now talking to you about the five books of this week so our first book is This Is Not The Jess Show by Anna Carey. This is a really cool young adult thriller novel that is sort of a combination of like the Truman Show meets My So-Called Life with like some Black Mirror in there. So we meet our protagonist, Jess, and she seems to be living sort of like an all-American average life in 
uh, I think it's just like somewhere right outside of New York. So it's sort of like, you know, feels like clueless, light, sort of, you know, uh, legally blonde, but everything like feels a little bit too perfect. And it's quickly revealed that the life that Jess is living is not actually <laughs> the life that she, uh, that she thought she was living. And I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but if, you know, maybe you can pick up on the fact that I compared it to The Truman Show and her life is not exactly what it seems. So she has to grapple with this sort of, you know, 17 years of existence in this world that was so perfectly curated that she also just thought was her life coming to terms with the fact that like that's not the real world and that's not the world that she's actually living in and how to escape that so there's definitely you know she's an interesting protagonist with that interesting theme there's a lot of larger commentary on what it means to be on tv what our notion of reality ugh, reality tv and consumption where how those play a part which is definitely like where the black mirror aspect comes into it um so there's a lot of setup in terms of like you know, I think you know where it's going, but again, it's not so much where it's going, but it, like how it's going to get there. And this is, um, this is not the Jess show number one. So we do end with a cliffhanger and there's definitely a lot more to explore in both the Jess show, the show, and also the larger world and universe. Um, it's a very fast read. I think I read it in an afternoon because it's not only a fast paced thriller, it is a young adult novel. Um, so it does just, you know, read really quick. And I don't know why young adult novels, because I find that they can be just as well written. And I think I want to talk about that with Lori Faria Stolars because her work does fall under the young adult umbrella and you'll notice that it probably makes up about I would say a third to a quarter of what I talk about on the podcast um there was a period in my life where I did heavily read young adults I think that's just because I sort of spiral once I read one book and I like it and then I find another book that's like that or I find another author like that and it sort of dovetails off of each other but when you're starting with a young adult branch now it'll if anything I'll start with my adult branches and then the young adult book will be like a little leaf on that tree but before I was reading a lot of them and it just wasn't really it just did feel formulaic it did sort of feel like I wasn't getting as much like literary value and that's not to discount young adult novels because I think that can happen with just as many like regular <laughs> novels as well particularly in sort of like the mass market paperback thriller there's a really fine line between being a really good author who has this mass appeal while also hitting the niches of sort of like off the beaten path and not feeling like it was written by a robot that all being said if you are into a sort of fast-paced young adult and when i say thriller too i mean it's definitely like a disturbing concept but there's no really dark stuff you know true crime fans there's no like rape or murder or death so if you're definitely if you're looking for something with a little bit of edge but a little bit lighter and not necessarily you know gory and murdery um but still you know playing with you psychologically definitely check this one out next we have the ugly cry by danielle henderson I always am excited to read a new book, but this one especially, I feel like Danielle is a friend, um, even though I don't know her. <laughs> I've been listening to her podcast, I Saw What You Did, that she co-hosts with Millie DeCherico, um, which they just talk about two movies every week, and they pick a random theme, and sometimes they're movies that I've seen, like last week's episode was Robocop and Terminator 2, both of which I watched last year, so I heavily enjoyed that one because I got all the references, and sometimes I haven't actually seen the movies, but it's still just so fun to hear them, you know, they not only talk about the movies and sort of talk about about um, how they feel about them and they both work with Danielle as a writer in television. Millie works for Turner Classic Movies. Um, that all being said, I feel like I knew Danielle, but it's not the sort of podcast, you know, you get to know them personally at the beginning, but I still, I don't know her as well as I would like to. And now through this novel, I mean, sorry, through this memoir, I learned so much more about her. And now listening to the podcast after having read this, I have this newfound appreciation and this newfound, like I already really liked her and wish we could meet in real life and feel like we would vibe. Although now she has left Los Angeles and moved to a farm in upstate New York, which is like, honestly, the dream. If you don't, I personally do like Los Angeles and think that the idea of a farm and like living off the land sounds appealing in theory but i do think i would get lonely and bored and even if i don't ever leave my apartment for a week i like to like know that the option is there and that like oh yeah there are a hundred places that can deliver to me anyway so this memoir is all about her life growing up and she had a really hard life she basically was raised by her grandmother. Her father was never really in the picture. Her mother left her as a young child, left her and her brother in the care of her grandmother, which 
was is both beautiful because the love that she and her grandmother have, like her grandmother is her maternal figure, is really special and well thought out and written because of course her grandmother wants what's best for her and really cares and loves about her, but also sees the pain and the sadness that come from not having parents in her life. Um, she, it's really cool to like know where she's at sort of, you know, knowing that all this leads to someone being successful in her, I'm, you know, assuming based on the podcast and where she's at in life that she's now able to buy a house and take care of her grandmother, able to support herself and have a job. And she really came from nothing. And she's not necessarily humble about it, but she just sort of wants to show you that this is where she was at. This is where she's been. Um, There's definitely a lot about growing up as a person of color in a more, you know, not super xenophobic town, but definitely, you know, there was racism. It was a time when she wasn't, you know, people of color stood out. So what it was like to grow up like that. Um, yeah, it, it mostly white neighborhoods. So she basically like moved back to her old neighborhood, which is really fascinating in itself. And they talked about that on the last episode of I Saw What You Did. Um, so if you're into memoirs that really delve into um, a particular period in someone's life. So this is particularly sort of from her childhood to when she can remember to growing up and being an adult and like leaving her town. So this is, you know, that has the coming of age. It has the tragic story of family being lost but also the found family and the relationships that you carve for yourself and just a lot of strength and resilience she's a wonderful writer um i really feel like i like i said like i know her and she really comes alive off of the page so check this one out really you know i don't see why you wouldn't like it i want to say this one is for everyone and speaking of for everyone this book the next book is the gunkle by stephen rowley pause for the water break I absolutely adored this one. I typically give my books a three to four star rating. It's very rare that I will give a book a two star rating, um, usually because I feel like I wouldn't have made it through it if it was that bad, but there are occasionally books where I will make it through and I'm like, I really didn't like this. I'm going to give it two stars. I don't think I've ever given a one star rating. And I do occasionally give five star ratings when I feel like the book was just so perfect and wonderful and joyful. And it doesn't even have to be joyful in the sense that like, it's all positive and happy content, um, though I do feel like the uncle is ultimately like bittersweet and happy and positive and just really feel good. I mean, this is a beach read in all of the right senses in this in the sense that it takes place over the summer. So if you're reading it over the summer, you can kind of relate to that summer state of mind. Or if you're reading it at a different point in life, you can romanticize the summer. Our main character, Patrick, is the uncle. It starts out with tragic circumstances where Patrick's best friend, who is married to his brother, so his sister-in-law, she passes away from cancer and leaves her two children, Maisie and Gus, that's their names, right? Yep, Maisie and Grant, I'm sorry, Maisie and Grant, to Patrick to stay with him over the summer. Only problem is he is sort of like a recluse. He is in his early 40s. He is a former... Uh, not child, like teenage star, and he is totally, you know, you can. It, it's formulaic in the plot sense where you can see that, okay, this is a guy who is not comfortable with himself or putting him, you know, opening himself up to relationships and thinks he's going to be terrible. And then the kids come to stay with him and it's bad in the beginning, but then they grow to love him. And then he also grows to love his sister through all that. So while that sounds formulaic, it's just like done in all of the right ways. Like there's sarcasm, it's witty, the banter between all the characters are realistic while it is formulaic it's not to say that there isn't a formula for a reason like if it ain't broke don't fix it I mean again it's like while you know that eventually yes I'm sure he'll grow to love the kids and probably stay with his family it's about like how he gets there and it's not just sort of a flip a switch sort of thing that you would get in a film you know a montage one day it really takes him time to not only bond with these kids and form this strong relationship but to discover this family and this sense of of love and belonging that he had closed himself off to so long ago. So he really has a lot of inner demons while still being like a fun and upbeat novel. I've read Stephen Rowley's other novels, Lucy and the Octopus, which was equally like wonderful and joyful and ultimately uplifting, but still filled with like a little bit of bit like sadness and bitterness. And I think that's why I love these so much and why I gave it five stars. It because it really feels like real life in all the best ways, like highlighting the highs, but also highlighting the lows and the little moments that come in between to just complete a real portrait and picture of these people's lives. And while I don't know if it would necessarily translate to being a perfect adaptation on screen or on TV. Um, I don't necessarily want to because it's just sort of like the way I imagined these characters in the universe. It was a fun to take a vacation from my mind and to immerse myself in these people's problems, which is also what makes a perfect beach read. So check out The Gunkle. Anybody, I think you will love it. If you don't, I will give you your money back or or your time back because you're probably some sort of soulless monster. 
Next, um, on the opposite side of the gunkle, we have Animal by Lisa Tadeo. This is definitely a one not for the faint of heart. It is about um, a young woman named Joan and the cruelty that she has endured in her life um, perceived and both you know objectively and subjectively from men and the way that she avenges that um, in the beginning of the novel. It's not a spoiler to let you know that her um, former lover slash boss slash man she was having an affair with excuse me, commits suicide and shoots himself right in front of her while she's on a date. So obviously that is traumatic and, you know, horrifying. And so that's sort of the inciting incident that forces Joan to move to Los Angeles, specifically the Malibu Canyon area, which while I have driven in that area a few times is a part of Los Angeles. It's even noted in in the novel quite a few times that it's completely different than the, the world of Beverly Hills or like Los Angeles proper. It's much more of like a hippie sort of forgotten time, much more lackadaisical, different way of life. Not to say that I live in Beverly Hills, but my way of life is definitely more, you know, traditional Los Angeles, as you can hear the buses beeping in the background. So it's not only like this lush portrait of this part of Los Angeles in California that you don't get to see too much, but also this lush portrait of a woman who has been wronged and her childhood and her relationships with her parents are extremely three dimensional in like all the best ways possible, like the both the love and the hatred and the psychology behind sort of like what has made Joan who she is. Um, she also in the present day the reason she moves to California is to befriend this woman Alice but it sort of feels like you know her the way she's studying Alice is almost like an animal hunting their prey so there's a lot of metaphorical and also you know literal you know animals and women as prey and predator and how we hunt and how we perceive other people and relationships the language is absolutely 100 percent i mean while it is definitely a darker novel um it's not glorifying in the sense that like gone girl sort of has that like look at her she's a good girl gone bad i mean it give lisa today is very careful with giving a rich backstory to joan that while not necessarily justifying her actions you know she's had a really hard fucked up life and she doesn't necessarily see it that way but it's the sympathy that the author has for her as a as a tragic heroine figure is really great um this is lisa today's first novel but she has previously written a nonfiction book called Three Women, which I absolutely loved. And that was her immersing her, herself in the lives of three different women. And though it was nonfiction, it definitely read like a fictional novel where she just has this really great way of making people's lives and giving them a purpose that's really unique and well written and makes them stick in your brain and also like a little bit of discomfort and not in the sort of sense of like a black mirror like oh dystopian but in the sense of discomfort of like that raw animalistic primal urge so if you're looking for something a little meatier a little heavier but still with some empowerment then check out animal and last but certainly certainly not least, we have Ace of Spades by Farida Abike Ayimedi, and I'm sure I butchered that last name, so I apologize in advance. Um, so Ace of Spades was another little surprise sleeper. So it started out as sort of what I thought of as a predictable young adult novel. I say that in air quotes where it's our main characters are Devin and Chiamaka. They are thriving at this private school. They are two of the only, if not the only, people of color at the school. And then it seems that people are blackmailing them and sabotaging them and out to get them. And so it sort of seemed like a little, like, Pretty Little Liars-esque, like, blackmail-y, you know, high schoolers being ruthful. But once it's the stakes are midway through the book, I would say the stakes get a lot more serious. There's more than just sort of, like, the casual racism at play. There's a lot more, like, societal structural racism that comes into play. That's where I think a lot of the comparisons to Get Out, and there's even a reference, the, the, there's a reference to The Sunken Place in the epigraph, which I'm a big fan of. Um, so it definitely took a turn in a really cool way. I think I read somewhere that there was sort of a thriller. And I love when the plot twist is not even necessarily like a deus ex machina, like, oh, it was him all along. It then like adds gravity to the first half of what you've read and makes it a lot more subtle while also being in your face. So it's a really cool um, take on the young adult novel, taking some you know, more Hitchcockian um, homages to, of course, Jordan Peele and Get Out and to, you know, playing a game and how secret societies are actually a lot more important and powerful while there is, of course, that slightly fantastical element of like, could this happen in real life? It's like, well, things very similar to it have probably definitely happened. And also speaking of young authors, Farida, I 
think this was inspired. She, um, in the little Q&A section I read, at the end of the book, she said that she came up with the idea during her freshman year of college and finished the book at her senior year of college. I'm like, by my senior year of college, I had a crappy student film and sometimes I'll show it to people, but it's more with like a sense of fondness for the experience than having anything I would actually want to put out into the world. And the fact that she put out this really cool um, boundary breaking in many senses, young adult novel is cool. So if you're into another fast paced young adult thriller that appeals to really anybody has universal appeal, does deal with some darker stuff um, regarding race and xenophobia and otherness, but I think is a really important read for everyone. So that being said, this is this week's five books. Make sure you check out the author interviews that have happened in the past that are coming up. As always, let me know what you're reading. I read and add all of your suggestions to my to be read list. Hopefully I will get there at some point, but so many books, so little time. But until next time, stay reading. Bye.